Tri-Cities News Team, taking action for you. Keeper Action News. It's a huge, huge benefit, not only to the office, but to law enforcement, the prosecutor's office, even the community as a whole. Coming up on Action News, autopsies associated with the Benton County Coroner's Office will now be performed locally for the first time in two years. We'll tell you how this new change will help local law enforcement agencies. Detectives have arrested a suspect accused of murdering a woman whose body was found in the Columbia River in September. Plus, leaders from the Association of Washington Business stop in Benton City to highlight manufacturing jobs across the state. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Stovall. Detectives have identified and arrested a suspect accused of murdering a woman after her body was found in the Columbia River on September 27th. Kennewick detectives say the suspect was known to a 34-year-old Brandy Ibanez. The suspect was taken into custody in Oregon on an arrest warrant and a no bail order related to charges in Kennewick. The suspect is currently awaiting extradition to the Benton County Jail. Detectives say evidence collected at Abanez's residence led them to investigate her death as a homicide. A police officer from Sunnyside is recovering at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle after he was shot while in the line of duty. Around 9 p.m. Monday, officers responded to a shots fired call at a home in Sunnyside. When they arrived, they heard several shots being fired from the home, including some toward officers one officer was shot. Medics rushed him to the local hospital and he was later airlifted to Harborview. The suspect fled the scene but was arrested a few blocks away. Ultimately, um, less lethal uh, munitions were used to stop him. So he, he wasn't shot with a firearm, just a, a soft round. The officer who was shot has three years of experience. Police say his name will be released later on in the investigation. Well, crucial information on cases involving a death will now be available sooner to our local law enforcement agencies. Benton County Coroner Bill Leach tells us the commissioners recently approved funds to hire a forensic pathologist so they can now do in-house autopsies. Bill Leach says the county has been without one since 2020, forcing all autopsies to be contracted with outside agencies like Spokane. It's a huge, huge benefit, not only to the office, but to law enforcement, the prosecutor's office, even the community as a whole. Because now we'll have near immediate results from an autopsy rather than having to wait, you know, days, weeks, or even sometimes months to get a written report back. Leach says this has been one of his goals since he took on the county coroner position. The funds will be made available on January 1st, so Leach says he's proactively looking for someone to fill the position. A suspected drunk driver is behind bars after deputies say he crashed his vehicle and lied to police. Last night, deputies with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office say they responded to the area of Glade, just north of Dogwood, for a reported vehicle theft. Once on scene, deputies say the driver has rolled his vehicle then attempted to leave the area as he reported it stolen. Deputies say the driver is facing charges for false reporting and driving under the influence. Leaders with the Association of Washington Business are touring the state to highlight manufacturing. Today, the tour stopped in Benton County. Reporter Jedediah Hoyt takes us inside for a closer look at the growing sector. This is our sixth annual statewide manufacturing bus tour celebrating job creators throughout Washington State. The AWB manufacturing tour is hoping to highlight the importance of manufacturing jobs throughout the state. 265,000 employees work in the sector and the vocation is responsible for 8% of Washington's workforce. In Benton County, there are over 200 companies employing around 4,600 workers with agricultural processing holding a significant majority of those employed. Average wage in the manufacturing sector, north of $60,000 right here locally. So these are great career jobs, these are great family jobs, and you can make a difference in manufacturing. Today, the tour stopped at Columbia Label in Benton City. 
Here, students and local leaders toured the facility, where among other things, the company produces labels for area wineries. Leaders say in the past few years especially, the business has been thriving. So think about the growth of that wine sector in 20 years, now it's a completely vertically integrated manufacturing sector. In 2021, the state unanimously passed the Best Manufacturing Act that sets an ambitious goal of doubling the manufacturing sector over the next 10 years. If we do the job right and reach the goal, that means there's north of 500 manufacturing companies here in 10 years. And Representative Matt Banke is the person who pioneered that legislation. He's right here from the Tri-Cities as well. And so we think it's really important to put a spotlight on manufacturing. And one of the things that we have certainly have seen on this tour is that manufacturing is robust, it's vibrant, it's diversified, and there's a lot of small manufacturers, a lot of medium manufacturers, and a lot of large manufacturers that make up that ecosystem called manufacturing right here in Washington State. Reporting in Benton City, Jedediah Hoyt, Action News. Tour leaders say in order to meet the goal of doubling manufacturing in our state, we need to solve problems in talent and workforce, as well as invest in hydroelectric and other renewable energy sources to meet power demand as the state continues to grow. Good evening, another beautiful afternoon, lots of sunshine today and better air qualities. That's been certainly nice with our temperature outside our studios right now, sitting at 76 degrees, a little bit of a breeze out of the east at six miles per hour. Headlines tonight will call for clear skies, cool nights and sunny, warm afternoons. We are looking at another beautiful day tomorrow. What about the rest of the week and heading into your weekend? We'll have all the details and your full storm tracker forecast coming up in just a few minutes. All right, thanks, Mike. Officers from the Department of Fish and Wildlife are investigating the deaths of six wolves that were poisoned in northeastern Washington. State leaders say toxicology tests showed the gray wolves died after ingesting poison in Stevens County earlier this year. The state is offering a $51,000 reward for information that leads to convictions in the case. Gray wolves are listed as endangered under Washington state law. Illegally killing the animal is punishable by up to one year in jail. Well, 181 animals are now in shelters in Washington state after being rescued from Hurricane Ian. Seattle Humane took in 68 of them, including dogs, cats, even guinea pigs. They say the animals brought to Washington were already being kept in Florida shelters freeing up space for animal workers there to take in more displaced pets. Leaders say that gives families a chance to reunite with their animals as soon as possible. There's people that have to evacuate their homes and the animals are missing. Um, and, and subsequently when they come back and start looking, they can't, they can't find the animals. We need to make sure that those animals are kept locally in the community. All of the animals are being evaluated to make sure they're healthy before finding their forever homes. Well, a new study reveals e-cigarette use among children and teens has surged this year. A tobacco-free advocate explains the data and new health concerns for teens. An urgent public health problem, that's what one organization is calling the use of e-cigarettes by children and teens. In a recent survey, millions of middle and high school students reported using e-cigarettes this year. In today's Health Minute, Jake Taylor has a deeper look at the data and what tobacco-free advocates say needs to happen to keep kids safe. Tonight's Health Minute is sponsored by Prosser Memorial Health. It's a potentially dangerous problem plaguing kids. More than two and a half million of middle and high school students in the U.S. reported using e-cigarettes this year, according to data from the CDC and FDA. But kids aren't just experimenting with e-cigarettes. They're using them all the time. Not only is the nicotine found in many e-cigarettes addictive, but it can also affect a developing brain which can impact attention, memory, and learning, says Vince Wilmore with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Many of the e-cigarettes on the market right now deliver huge doses of nicotine. Some of them deliver as much nicotine as a pack of 20 cigarettes. According to the 2022 National Youth Tobacco Survey, nearly 85% of current middle and high school users chose flavored products. 
fruit was the top preferred flavor, followed by mint, menthol, and candy or other sweet flavors. Uh, we need to clear the market of flavored products. But unfortunately, the FDA has missed deadline after deadline to protect our kids. In a statement, the FDA says it's, quote, actively working to identify violations and to swiftly seek corrective actions, particularly for products popular among youth. The agency says it issued warning letters to some of the companies that sell the brand most commonly reported in the survey, adding that the products are being sold without marketing authorization. The FDA reports it's illegal for e-cigarettes that are not FDA authorized to be sold. Penalties for retailers or distributors can include seizure, injunction, or a fine. The debates, the campaign ads, are all meant to convince voters. Are they working and what will matter most just one month from now on Election Day? I'm Scott Thuman in Washington to show you next. We're now exactly four weeks from Election Day as candidates and parties are trying to persuade voters what they should care most about, both on policies and personalities. So what are the biggest dividing issues and what do the latest predictions tell us about who will have control of Congress? Sinclair Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman has the new numbers. This is the Ohio Senate debate. It's debate season, and for those who like a dose of drama in their politics, there is no shortage, like in the highly contentious Ohio Senate race. When you have guys like J.D. Vance who can't stand up to anybody, Donald Trump said to J.D. Vance, all you do is kiss my ass to get my support. Tim Ryan, who runs all these TV commercials saying that he wants to appeal to Trump voters, wants to appeal to Republicans, also says that he wants to <clears throat> kill and confront, what is it, the MAGA movement, Tim? And separating the sides, divisive wedge issues. According to one breakdown by Axios, Democrats are spending millions of dollars on ads to galvanize voters upset about eroding abortion rights. Though Senator Bernie Sanders warns campaigning mostly on abortion would be a mistake, and Democrats have to fight Republican narratives that the left is dangerous for the economy. While President Biden suggests any gains will be lost if Democrats lose at the polls. If Republicans take control of the Congress. These historic victories we just won for the American people are going to be taken away. Republicans, meanwhile, highlighting a nationwide surge in crime, taking to the airwaves to paint Democrats as soft. The bad guys belong in jail, and Mandela Barnes belongs nowhere near the Senate. A risk Republicans allege to all Americans' safety. As it stands right now, Democrats have the power on the Hill. In the House, it is narrow, and many analysts like those over at Real Clear Politics show Republicans will change that these midterms. The Senate, though, it's a much different story. There are at least 10 races you see here across the country that are considered battlegrounds. Now, currently, the Senate is split down the middle, 50-50. And while there is polling showing the GOP in position to take that chamber too, others show Democrats holding on all of it, setting the stage for a nail-biter just one month from now. On Capitol Hill, I'm Scott Thuman. A railway strike that could wreak havoc on the U.S. economy is closer to reality. That's because Rail Workers Division of the Brotherhood of Teamsters, one of the largest in the country, rejects a deal forged by the Biden administration. About 56 percent of their 11,000 workers voted against it, raising the possibility of a strike next month. If there's no agreement soon, the possibility of congressional action to impose a resolution on the railroads and unions increases. U.S. lawmakers hinted at that possibility if the GOP wins back the House. The International Monetary Fund anticipates 2023 will feel like a recession for millions around the world. In its world economic outlook, the IMF predicts global growth will slow to 2.7 percent next year, down from the 2.9 percent it estimated in July. The organization reports this is the weakest growth since 2001, aside from the global financial crisis and the peak of COVID-19. Experts say three issues are creating a, quote, volatile period economically, geopolitically, and 
ecologically, and this includes Russia's invasion of Ukraine, inflation, and China's economic slowdown. Good evening and welcome back. A nice day today. Lots of sunshine and that air quality finally improving for us. Compliments of a dry cold front that moved in last night that kind of pushed a lot of that smoke out of the basin for us. And our air quality readings now in the good category. We could start to see these air qualities deteriorate once again though over the next couple of days. Compliments of this strong ridge of high pressure. We should be pretty good again tomorrow. Uh, but by Thursday and Friday, we could see some of that smoke and haze begin to filter back in across the basin at times, mainly because of this strong ridge of high pressure that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's going to stick around for a while. In the meantime, we'll enjoy some pretty nice temperatures with numbers running well above the seasonal average. Right now at the airport in Pasco, 76 degrees. Walla Walla at 71. Pendleton, you're checking in at 74 right now. Lots of sunshine out there, a little bit of a breeze. At 6 out of the east-northeast in Pasco, Walla Walla, calm conditions. Pendleton coming out of the north at about 3 miles per hour. Still looking at air quality alerts for areas up towards Douglas and Chelan counties, including portions of Yakima County until further notice. Uh, really until we get a system coming through that uh, will bring some good wetting rain along with it that will put an end to the fire season. And that just hasn't happened yet, and it's not in the forecast. Here's our satellite radar over the last three hours. Not much to speak of here at all. In fact, not a cloud in sight. The only thing that we uh, are seeing across portions of the west is a little bit of haze and smoke in some parts outside of that. It is quiet as can be. We move forward into Wednesday. Lots of sunshine again tomorrow. We'll continue that into Thursday. Friday through the weekend as that high pressure off the coast continues to hold, diverts the storm track well to the north of us. It's an omega high. It's a blocking ridge that is uh, persistent. And until we get a stronger system to break that down, this is what we're looking at. Upper 70s, maybe even some low 80s. Lows at night cooling off nicely into the 40s. And a persistent uh, fall pattern here for us that will continue through at least the weekend and probably the first part of next week before we start to see some changes. And even then, we don't really know because going out beyond really Monday or Tuesday is a really a roll of the dice. So we'll see how it goes for us. 68 for Seattle tomorrow, with some clouds in the AM. Outside of that, sunshine by the afternoon, 80 for Portland, 75 for Spokane. Really beautiful fall weather. Lows at night in the 40s as we cool off nicely. Highs tomorrow in the upper 70s, 76 for Walla Walla. And the trend continues. So enjoy it. Get some outdoor work done because you know these temperatures won't last forever. Look at Walla Walla, mid 70s through the weekend, staying sunny and dry. We will watch for areas of haze and smoke, unfortunately, as well as the Tri Cities into the upper 70s through the weekend, all the way into next week. And let's look at your forecast. Have a great night. All right, thanks, Mike. Well, a West Virginia man breaks a world record after growing some impressive vegetables and we'll tell you more about what he's growing up next stay with us a farmer in west virginia has earned a whale of a reputation with his love for these giant vegetables. He's only been growing them since last year and has already broken some state records in the process. But last weekend, he broke the world record for most varieties of jumbo veggies grown in one season. He grew 36 varieties, three more than the previous record. They included jumbo sized pumpkins, beets and carrots. Next year, he wants to earn what's known as a grower's jacket, which means he'll try to grow three giant pumpkins with a combined weight of at least 4,000 pounds. Well, lots of great weather for pumpkin patches are going out uh, and about for sure. Our weather today pretty spectacular with better air qualities and we expect that again tomorrow. We may start to see this smoke and haze filter back in though under this strong ridge of high pressure that's going to hold for us for the next several days. Look at those numbers well above the average when we're normally around 70 degrees. Uh, that is, you can see a good 10 degrees plus above the norm. Mid 70s through the weekend all the way into next week. We'll do the same for the Tri-Cities. Lots of sunshine. Lows at night cooling off into the 40s, but nice warm sunny afternoons. Beautiful autumn days here. Still waiting on that system to come in to clean things out, but it'll get here soon. Enjoy yeah. the beautiful weather. So nice. All right. We're back at six. Hope you are too. Good night. Good night.